So the WHO guidelines have evolved. Uh, those who've been in the HIV business for long enough have sort of seen this gradual transition of guidelines. And this is really from 2002 up to where we are today. Um, a lot of us in the room are probably from the era where we, had to, where we were only allowed to start antiretroviral treatment at a CD4 count threshold of less than 200. So it's where we are now, which is, a, which is really um, uh, treating HIV at any CD4 count threshold. We've moved towards early treatment, simplified treatment, and less toxic and more robust regimens as we've moved along and progress with the guidelines. So how are we doing globally? So majority of countries have approved, and so much so that in mid-2019, 127 countries are now treating everybody irrespective of CD4 counts. In terms of transition to dolotegravir, this mainly applies to lower and middle income countries, um, and inclusion of dolotegravir as the preferred version of the regimen up to mid-2019, 123 countries have been included in this. So this is really an update really from uh, a, a recommendation by WHO in 2018, and this was an update released in the IAS in 2019 in Mexico. Um, Donatek Resto remains um, the preferred um, anchor drug to be combined with two NRTIs preferred first-line regimen for people living with HIV. I'm going to concentrate mainly on adults and adolescents um, and not concentrate so much on infants and children because that's not really my area. Um, but the strength of the recommendation by WHO has moved from a conditional recommendation to a stronger recommendation. If Efavirenz at a lower dose of 400 milligrams was included uh, in the 2018 WHO recommendations, but now it's, uh, it was under special circumstances. It's now, you know, it was in the alternative line along with uh, Efavirenz 600 milligrams, but it's now um, sort of kicked the 600 milligram um, option out, and it's the preferred alternative Efavirenz dose. And this has appeared in there largely because over the past year, there's been more PK and uh, PD data uh, on low dose Efavirenz in TB. Uh, a co-infection, as well as in pregnant women. So when comparing Dolotegravir and Fabrix 600, so in a lot of my, what I'm going to talk about is largely pertaining to a country like Malaysia, because I'm more familiar with the situation in Malaysia. So if we're comparing Dolotegravir and Fabrix 600 milligrams, Dolotegravir tends to fare better in terms of um, uh, uh, viral suppression, CD4 count recovery at any time point, treatment discontinuations due to any adverse events, uh, and neuropsychiatric AIDS, uh, sorry, adverse events. And, and, and it's associated, as we know, with a higher genetic barrier to resistance. When you compare the Fabrin's 400 with the Fabrin's 600 in the first line antiretroviral regimen, there, are, there is certainly evidence for um, uh, how Efavirenz uh, compares better. So in, certainly in terms of treatment discontinuations due to adverse events and, and uh, treatment related adverse events related to uh, Efavirenz. So when looking at the uh, preferred and alternative first line antiretroviral regimens, and we're in the process of updating our own guidelines, the preferred first line regimen is two NRTIs combined with Dolotegravir. And the alternative first line regimen as mentioned earlier is two NRTIs, so two TDF3TC or FTC, and if, and if I was 400 milligrams. You will notice that essentially that um, the, you know, the 600 milligram dose has now been moved into the special circumstances uh, region. What is also um, interesting to note is that as other generic formulations also have become available in other parts of the world, uh, TAF has made an appearance as well for the first time uh, within the WHO guidelines. Oh, sorry. So, so what are the pros and cons of efavirenz? I mean, we're all very familiar with efavirenz. Uh, if, if we take it once daily, it's very, very, very cheap. It's, uh, it's co-formulated, we have a huge experience base with it, and it's very TB friendly. Yesterday we heard from Prof. 
Biba was presenting the Reflect study, it's still the preferred anchor drug for use in TB co-infection. <coughs> Those who have worked with the pharynx for a long time know that the side effects are very predictable, and in most cases, they can substitute very uh, easily. But it has that limited genetic barrier to resistance, and that's one of the problems with the pharynx. So majority of people who fail with the pharynx fail with resistance, especially to MNRTIs. And as we see patients with the pharynx, and we become better at screening central nervous system side effects secondary to pharynx, we in ourselves um, are more aware of the CNS side effects um, associated with pharynx. But the questions need to be asked. Pharynx can cause a severe rash, um, it, can, it's, it's hep, can be hepatotoxic, and interestingly in African populations, I haven't seen this very much in Asian populations, gynecomastia is well described as a side effect. And in the area where we're thinking about comorbidities <coughs> increasing cardiovascular risk, it is a bit disheartening at times to give a drug which is associated um, with increasing your lipids. The majority of patients who um, end up on infabrins also end up on a lipid-lowering drug. Um, we know that about the CNS side effects of the fabric, such as depression, and some serious CNS side effects have been recently recognized. Um, so depression is depression, but when, when, when depression sort of moves into the area of suicidality or increased risk of suicidal behavior, it becomes a bit more of a concern. This was a meta-analysis done by the ACTG of four randomized controlled trials, um, looking at uh, suicidality as an endpoint. And this, this showed essentially a two times higher risk for suicidality. This was not replicated in subsequent studies, uh, um, such as, for example, the DAD study, which was prompted by this meta-analysis, and they weren't able to show lack of association between the use of the pharynx and death from suicide. But I think this sort of points towards the seriousness of the use of the pharynx and suicidality. More recently, in uh, the sub-analysis of the START study, uh, there was an association between the use of ephabrins and a three times increased risk of suicidal behavior. And there was an association between those, in, the, in those patients with a previous psychiatric diagnosis. So ephabrins 400 milligrams on the hand is, sort of, is, is, is not quite the new kid on the block, but it's, it's, it's becoming a favorite in countries which cannot transition to dolotegravir, so it provides an interim transition uh, in the in-between period. In terms of viral load suppression, the chief equivalent viral load suppression was found to be non-inferior to the 600 milligram dose, and it was associated with a reduction in adverse um, events related to efavirenz and um, discontinuations due to adverse events. But in terms of and in terms of viral suppression, it was all right. So it's okay to use 400 milligrams, uh, but provided we keep excessive. The problem with efavirenz 400 milligrams in Malaysia is that we have um, the 200 milligram dose, it's Ifemet, uh, I can't remember, I think it's Ifemet, it's licensed as a 200 milligram dose, you need to give two tablets. Uh, it is cheaper, certainly cheaper than Dolotegravir, <coughs> but it's not quite as cheap as uh, generic Dol uh, generic Ifemet 600 milligrams. Then is um, everybody's favorite drug at the moment, Dolotegravir, which is, you know, for a long time it seemed like it could do no wrong, was associated with a higher genetic barrier to resistance, uh, very good efficacy overall, very rapid viral load suppression, it's very useful in, in HIV positive uh, women presented in pregnancy. It's active against HIV2 infection, not, a, not, a, not something we see very much in this part of the world, but it's always good to have. It's available in single and as fixed dose formulations, very few drug interactions, but only now recently as uh, toxicity data coming out. Now this is data from Europe, mainly from two German cohorts in Hamburg. Uh, it is a retrospective analysis, so there, there's some limitations associated with that kind of analysis. Looking at um, a fairly large number, 1,900 patients who started insulin-based therapies. And this showed essentially that the rate of discontinuations due to dolotegravir compared to other integrase inhibitors were much higher over a period of 12 months. This, and in other studies, this was replicated. Most of them were retrospective, so very hard to sort of generalize. And associations with discontinuations due to dolotegravir essentially were associated with female age, a female gender, sorry, older age of more than 60 years, and co-formulation with a bank of it. 
And as you move to the words of the later years, there was a greater appreciation by uh, infectious disease physicians of the CNS toxicity associated with dolutegravir, and therefore physicians were more likely to switch patients off, off, off dolutegravir because of the CNS side effects. This was shown by Prof. Adiba yesterday at the advanced uh, uh, clinical trial done in South Africa. Um, it was a first-line uh, antiretroviral, <coughs> first-line trial done in South Africa, recruiting large numbers of patients, 1,053 patients, to one of three arms. Here they compared either a TAF-based dolutegravir regimen to TDF-based dolutegravir to the standard of care regimen of TDF FTC fabrics. Essentially, the dolutegravir-based regimens uh, were found to be non-inferiative fabrics, um, which, which, which was which not unsurprising as such. Um, this also interestingly pointed towards the cohort. This was in South Africa. So unlike most clinical trials elsewhere, had a large female um, percentage of 60% female and mostly black, 99%. Median CD4 count of about 337. So dolotegravate-based regimen uh, achieved non-inferiority compared to fabrics-based regimen in terms of the primary endpoint of achieving viral load undetectability of less than 50 at 48 weeks. But what was astounding, essentially, and this was also in um, uh, Michelle Mohau's presentation, was that uh, the, the significant increase in weight gain, which is only, we're only really beginning to try and look into it and understand it a bit better. So there was, a significant increase in weight gain uh, with both with dolotegravir-based regimens compared to fabrics. So if you look at that, and this is at 96 weeks, uh, so the TAF FTC dolotegravir-based regimen was associated with greatest weight gain compared to TDF FTC, um, and that's the fabrics of the standard of care regimen. But this effect of weight gain was more, more pronounced in women um, uh, and and it did not and it continued to increase after the 48 week mark. Whereas in men, it sort of plateaued. And you see this continued increase in weight gain um, in women. So this is, and there are a lot of questions, and that's why there's a lot of interest looking, wanting to look into this phenomenon of weight gain, and does it translate into increased cardiovascular risk or other metabolic complications? The story about dolotegravir and neural tube defects um, was also a, a, an, um, an interesting topic um, in, in the IS 2019. And this is basically reporting an update of the Sopamo cohort, which is a cohort uh, reporting on birth outcomes originally to look at fabrins, or uh, exposure to fabrins during pregnancy. The update of this cohort, uh, which took them to um, March 2019, uh, reported only one additional neural tube defect, which therefore essentially brought the prevalence down from 0 0.94 to 0 0.3. This was still associated with a significant increase um, compared to non dolotegravir based regimens. And it's important how we translate this information to women. So that the initial signal was not as high as we thought, uh, but still there is an increase. And, and um, however, this was only shown in the Sopamo cohort. This was not shown in a uh, large Brazilian cohort of about 382 pregnancies, um, no neural tube defects, and, and, and what was reported in the antiretroviral pregnancy registry. But there are also cons, and also when, when, when the information was released by WHO, perhaps a bit, um, probably prematurely, you still always have to consider the con of using an alternative regimen. And so using efavirenz is okay, but protease inhibitors are not great in its association with preterm delivery, and models showing more biological failure and transmission of efavirenz compared to dolotegravir. But more importantly is when the information was also initially released, there was very little community engagement. Um, and, and, and I think this is a lesson for everybody working within the HIV community that we are really, the community is at the center and every decision or guideline that we choose to roll out should really involve the community in the decision making. And so women really should be informed of the potential risks associated with dolotegravir, but really it's up to them to make their informed choice. 
But what it also highlights is that overall globally, in Malaysia included, is that women have generally very poor access to effective contraception. And this was an issue uh, which was raised by Margaret in terms of poor sexual reproductive health and contraception. Just moving on to the second line antiretroviral regimen and the WHO recommendations, now Dolotegravir, it seems to be taking over every single guideline, including second line. Uh, in combination with optimized NRTI backbone in adults and adolescents. And this is essentially unchanged from the 2018 recommendations. Boosted protease inhibitors are there, but mainly um, are there if there's a recommendation to switch to them if you start on a, uh, on a dollar based regimen as first line. But if you start on an NRTI based regimen, the recommendation is to switch to dollar And this was largely um, data from um, the Dawning study, where Dolotegravir Do was a randomized controlled trial of patients failing an NNRTI-based therapy, were randomized either to receive a Dolotegravir-based regimen or Pelitra-based regimen. Dolotegravir did better, both in terms of viral suppression, uh, overall treatment emergent, um, sorry, treatment emergent adverse events, and treatment discontinuations due to adverse events, which was not surprising. Uh, Pelitra is a fairly nasty drug, uh, associated with a number of gastrointestinal side effects and metabolic issues. So really, in fact, um, dolotegravir showed superiority compared to the pinavir ritonavir. Now, more patients on the dolotegravir arm uh, did not fail compared to um, the penetra arm, but more importantly, treatment emergent resistance on the dolotegravir arm, as in the penetra arm, were very, very few. So what the update in the 2019 WHO recommendations made was that essentially if you started on a Truvada-based regimen and Dolotegravir, um, the advice that when you switch to a second line regimen, you should switch the NRTI back then, very much like their previous recommendation with protease and you should switch the, the backbone as well to AZT3TC. Uh, sorry, I apologize. So if you're starting with the Fabrins, Truvada and Fabrins, then you should switch to AZT3TC and dolotegravir. So Truvada switches to com to Combavir. Uh, if you start on a dolotegravir-based regimen, you switch to a protease inhibitor based regimen, and you also switch the nutricide backbone. And, and the reason for this was largely um, some data reported in COI in 2018, whereby if if uh, and this was reporting on the impact of NRTI backbone on the efficacy of dolotegravir compared to Calitra's second line art, depending on whether you follow a, the WHO recommended second line NRTI backbone. So if you switch from Truvada to uh, Combavir or Combavir to Truvada. Okay, so if you, if you follow that, uh, and if you look at um, dolotegravir specifically, uh, the treatment difference is largely within the dolotegravir arm. So 87% uh, versus 75% so treatment difference of 12% compared only to a treatment difference of 5.6% in the Kalitra arm. So there's some guidance about transition to uh, newer antiretroviral drugs, um, which have been provided by uh, WHO since 2017. And this is largely depending on your surveillance of NNRTI pre-treatment HIV drug resistance. The recommendation essentially is that countries should be changing their first line antiretroviral regimen away from NNRTIs if the levels of NNRTI drug resistance exceed that of 10%. This is some data from Malaysia. We, uh, this was the um, latest one that I could find of pre-treatment HIV drug resistance in Malaysia. This was a very small sample size, 45 samples from four hospitals. Only 40 patient samples could be amplified. Unsurprisingly, CR CRF01 AE was a predominant HIV subtype, and the overall prevalence of drug resistance mutations uh, to any NRTI, NNRTI, or PI was about 35%. But it gives you a sense that there is some that there is a bit of a concern. This is a small sample size, so you can't really say very much. But the, 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 the prevalence of uh, pre-treatment drug resistance was about 17.5%. So really, we should be thinking about transition to dolotegravir, but how do you do it? So, but, but more importantly, it re reinforces that issue. We need to strengthen country surveillance 
of free treatment, free treatment drug resistance to the four national guidelines. Once again, some, we have some um, um, advice and some uh, guidelines from the um, WHO uh, looking at factors that can influence transition to dolotegravir. So looking at pre-treatment drug resistance in particular, but the, 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 I think, I guess the main issue measure is the availability of generic formulations. Now, uh, coming back to somewhere more local, and, and uh, as I approach sort of the end of this presentation, this is this is the Malaysian guidelines. Uh, it was updated in 2017. It's, it's, it's due for review now. Um, and our preferred first-line antiretroviral therapy in 2017 is a uh, defibrillin-based regimen. Uh, but we did have uh, integrated inhibitors as an alternative first-line if we're intolerant, if the patient's intolerant to LNRTIs. Um, Second-line regimens are, were, uh, are protease inhibitor-based, but you can once again see that dolotegravir and uh, dolotegravir is also in the second-line uh, regimen recommendation in the local guidelines. So maybe just to end, and, and it leads forward to the panel discussion, uh, and just a summary of dolotegravir Malaysia, an example of an excess issue. So Malaysia is an upper-middle-income country and it often suffers from that middle income trap with, with all other drugs. We know, we've heard it before, and sometimes you keep on banging your head against the wall. Dolotegravir is registered in Malaysia, it has been registered in Malaysia for quite a while. The adult formulation of Dolotegravir is as protected by patent, although it does not apply to the pediatric formulation. The patent is expi as expected to expire in 2027. Do we want to wait that long? Malaysia is excluded currently from the voluntary licensing agreement issued by Cave Healthcare through Medicines Patent Pool because it's an upper middle income country. And as a result, there's no availability of generic dolotegravir. Currently, the originated price of dolotegravir is too expensive for it to be cost effective for first line use compared with generic fabrics. Now, fabrics is really, really, it's about $15 in, in Malaysia. And, you know, Dollar Tech, on the other hand, is, is I mean, you've got to give it, the, the company itself has brought down um, the price very quickly. If you compare, let's say, to Calitra, Calitra is still ridiculously priced <laughs> after it has been in the market for so long. Dollar Tech has made a significant reduction in price, but it's still beyond the, the, the scope of many. Dolotegravir is listed, as I've shown you, as an alternative first line. Uh, it intolerant to NNRTIs in the national guidelines. There's no country policy yet, uh, as far as I'm aware, on introducing dolotegravir as preferred first line. But it has the potential to replace PIs as the preferred second line regimen, and I know this is happening already, but is that enough? Um, and as a result, it draws people into these buyers' clubs. They are happening, um, and, but they're not talking to each other. That's the other problem as well. And some are from this country, some are from that country. Uh, and this, the question of sustainability of these bias clubs also come into question, and, and, and especially as there's a potential to interrupt patient supplies to generic dolotegravir. But it is happening, and surely we can do better. So, I mean, this is not just, we need more advocacy and community engagement. This is not just, this is only part of the issue. I think a lot of community um, members also are very unaware of Dolotegravir uh, globally. And I think that also needs to change. Uh, I think the global people living with HIV are very aware of Dolotegravir. But within Malaysia, I think there's that disconnect still. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot of more advocacy from that point of view. So where do we go from here? is the question. And that leads us to this panel discussion, um, uh, which I'm about to 